Hello everyone, my name is Costa Solomos and I'm a second year PhD student at USC. Today I will present your work named Tales of Fave Icon and Cases Persistent Tracking in Modern Browsers. This paper is a joint work with John Christoph, Chris Kanich and my advisor Jason Palakis. Approximately 20 years ago, Microsoft introduced Fave Icons for Internet Explorer in order to enhance the user navigation experience. Originally, the fave icons were small images associated with a website and were only shown in the bookmarks bar. Today, they are shown in different places inside the browser, like the address bar and the tabs, and mobile and desktop browsers support their usage. When a browser loads a website, it automatically issues a request in order to look up for the fave icon. The fave icon is stored in the header of the HTML web page inside the rel tag. This attribute tag is responsible for creating the relationship between the icon resource and the page. Similar to other resources that the browser accesses and needs to access fast, the fave icons are independently stored in a dedicated fave icon cache. This cache stores different values that include the page URL, the fave icon ID and name, and other meta information like the expiration time and the fave icons dimensions. There is also a set of rules that defines how the browsers can use and access this cache. The first policy defines the requirement of creating a new entry. On every page visit, the browser looks up for a fave icon in the cache. If this specific fave icon doesn't exist, it issues a new request and creates a new cache entry after the successful fetch and render of the icon. In any subsequent visit, the browser uses the cache fave icon until it expires or if it is modified by the page. Another policy is present for customizing the websites. This policy defines that when the browser navigates to subdomains or the page's inner paths, the cache will create separate entries if different fave icons are delivered. Regarding now the write and read permissions, there is a specific policy defined only by the fave icon cache and we didn't observe uh, this policy in the other caches in the browser. When the browser operates in incognito mode, it can access the existing cast icons without modifying the old ones or storing new entries. This means that it has the permission to read but not to write. Since the fave icon cache behavior is so uncommon and unique, we are able to leverage its properties and design a persistent tracking mechanism that identifies the user across visits and bypasses incognito mode restrictions. In practice, an attacker that controls a website can store a browser ID to the user by encoding the website subpaths as bits of a vector and serving different fave icons for each path. This combination of cast fave icons forms a persistent identifier that can be retrieved in every browser visit. In our threat model, we assume that the attacker is any website that wants to identify the user when a, a cookie or other stateful data are not present. We also assume that the attacker creates a unique browser ID that stores it through redirections in its inner paths or subdomains. For retrieving this identifier, the attacker's website redirects the browser through all the subdomains and by logging the presence or absence of the fave icon requests, it rebuilds the browser identifier every time. Now, let's see how the attack works in practice. Here we have an example where a browser visits the attacker website. At first, it requests the main page and also it automatically requests the fave icon since this is the default behavior. This indicates that the user is new and has never visited the website before. The website creates a new browser identifier and a redirection chain containing the inner paths that generate this identifier. When the identifier is ready, it forces a redirection to the inner paths. Then, the browser visits the first inner path of the redirection chain and after the, the initial request for the page, the fave icon is requested. When the browser fetches it, it stores it on the fave icon cache, and the redirection proceeds to the next path of the chain that represents the next bit on the identifier. Similarly, when the browser visits the page, it fetches and caches 
the fave icon and is automatically redirected to the next path. This process is repeated until all the paths of the redirection chain are visited and all the fave icons are successfully fetched. When there is no other path in the chain, the identifier is permanently stored on the browser. Now, let's assume that we are on the second phase, that we have already write the identifier and we want to reconstruct it. Assume again that we have a victim browser that visits again the web page and requests the base domain. Since uh, the fave icon is already cast, it does not issue any additional request and the website indicates that the browser has already a stored identifier. In this case, it builds a redirection chain that contains all the available paths to force the browser to visit all the inner paths. After that, the browser requests the first inner path. Since the fave icon is already cast, there are no additional requests. On the backend, the server logs this information as a presence of a bit on the identifier that is encoded as one. Similarly, it forces uh, the browser to visit the next path in the sequence. The browser again requests the page and since it has never been visited before, it also requests its fave icon. The presence of a fave icon request under the specific domain is encoded at zero in the corresponding identifier bit. To ensure the integrity of the cache, during the read of the identifier, the server raises a network error for all the fave icon requests and no additional icons are fetched or delivered. When the response is back, a redirection to the next path is again forced. This process is repeated for all the available paths and the server logs at each step the fave icon requests. In that way, it can accurately rebuild the identifier. When there are no other path visits, the server has successfully retrieved the identifier. Our attack is easily employed with uh, page of directions and the utilization of this specific uh, fave icon cache. We also identified that most of the popular web browsers in different operating systems are affected by our attack. We also tested that the attack is feasible even if we run the browser in private incognito mode and even after clearing the cookies and the browsing history. As expected, none of these modes or even when using anti-tracking extensions and tracking blocking extensions cannot detect the attack and alter its default behavior. Moving on to the evaluation, we quantified the effectiveness and the performance of our attack under different experimental setups. For every phase, we measure the time required for the browser to complete the redirections and for the server to respond to the requests. As can be seen from the plot, the writing times vary for the different ID sizes and on average we can write a full 32-bit identifier in approximately less than 3 seconds. On the contrary, due to the nature of the attack and the redirection on the paths, the reading times are more narrow and we can reconstruct the same identifier in approximately 5 seconds. Using a 32-bit identifier, we can fingerprint more than 4 billion users that reflects to an internet scale users. These numbers indicate that our attack is practical under real-world settings since the page latency introduced by trackers on modern websites is more than 10 seconds. However, we can further optimize the execution time by introducing one more complex dimension. Our observation here is that since browser fingerprints do not provide sufficient information to identify uniquely devices at the large iterand scale, they can be used to enhance other tracking mechanisms. As previous studies have shown, depending on their type, browser attributes can frequently change. However, there is a subset of robust features over the time, including mostly device-related attributes that rarely change, if do ever. To quantify the availability and the distribution of these attributes in a browser, we gained access to a dataset of real browser fingerprints collected by the AMA Unique website. Based on the attribute values, we calculated the total entropy of uh, these features in number of bits. As we can see here, we measured that at least 16 bits of information are available for each browser 
regardless of the operating system and the device. For more than half of the devices running Windows desktop, we gain at least 24 bits of entropy, while for others like Linux and macOS, we have 19 bits of information available. These numbers give credence to our optimization approach since we can combine the browser fingerprint with our fav icon identifier and further optimize our attack by reducing the total number of needed redirections to write the same identifier size. To further evaluate this approach's practicality, we also computed the time required to read and access each browser attribute. Since most of the features are directly available through JavaScript calls, we require less than 200 milliseconds to generate the browser fingerprint. Adding this overhead in the total uh, baseline attack duration, we observe that we can reconstruct a full 32-bit identifier by combining the browser fingerprint entropy and the fav icon identifier in less than two seconds. Also, since as we also observed in the dataset, users might deploy fingerprint defense tools and block some attributes, we computed the entropy gained by the remaining available features. Even if the canvas and the WebGL defenses are considered really powerful, we have access to sufficient number of attributes and we verify that the attack is still practical and efficient since it can be executed in approximately 3 seconds. Also, our attack's performance depends on the network latency and the availability both on the browser and the server side. We further evaluated uh, this performance of the baseline attack without using the fingerprints for several servers and client setups and experimented with various realistic scenarios. As expected, the performance is increased for both stages of the attack when the client and the server distance is minimized. Under the optimal parameters, with a minimum redirection overhead and decreased network latency over high-speed networks, the attack can be executed in a significantly shorter time. In general, these experiments verify that attackers can deploy large-scale and dedicated infrastructure and virtual machines to achieve the minimum attack duration. We provide more experiments on that inside the paper. As we have shown so far, due to the browser functionality leveraged by our attack, there is no primary defense that can prevent it without affecting the user's browsing experience. A potential solution that does not introduce overhead could be the incognito mode isolation from accessing the cache and creating separate instances for every private decision like the Tor browser. Another straightforward solution for the browsers is to erase the fav icon cache whenever the user deletes the cookies or the browsing history. Since the privacy implications of our attack are critical, we notified the vulnerable browsers. Brave has already deployed a countermeasure for the fav icon attack, while the others are still working on potential mitigations and redesign of the functionality. To summarize, this work presented a neville persistent fav icon tracking mechanism that enables long-term tracking and bypasses the incognito mode restriction and anti-tracking defenses. We showed in the paper that when browser figure bits are combined with other mechanisms, they can create more robust and stealth tracking vectors. To address our threats, browser needs to redesign policies and modify their functionality. Thank you for your time and I'm available anytime for any questions.